everyone. Welcome back to Think Outside the Board. I'm your host, Brian Tui, and this is the early July Kickstarter update, which means that in this video, I'm going to be talking to you about projects that are completing their funding from July 1st through July 15th. And I have a handful of seven featured projects to share with you today. After that, I will talk to you a little bit about games that I personally pledged from the last period, games that I have acquired into my collection since the last period, which this time is actually none. No games acquired this period. And finally, games that I have played since the last video, and I'll talk in a little bit more detail about those games. <laughs> so let's get things started, and we'll kick things off with The Binding of Isaac, Four Souls Requiem. This will fund on July 1st. Their minimum funding for this project was $100,000. They're currently sitting at $5.4 million, which is 54 times their minimum requested funding. So they're doing quite well. And unlike most games that I profile, this one has a lot of merch. So a lot of stuffed animals, enamel pins and things like that. And I won't be going over all of those add-ons because it's just, it's a lot of merch. It's not relevant to the gameplay. Let's talk about the game. This game is for one to four players. It is a medium heavy game, essentially a card game. I put the risk on this one at medium high. The reason being that this is Edmund McMillan's board game company and they've only done a couple board games uh, so far. They did the original Binding of Isaac board game as well as a game called Tapeworm. Now, if you're more familiar with Edmund McMillan from the video game scene, that's where he got his start creating games and he did Meat Boy and The Binding of Isaac. So his first foray into the board game world was essentially a board game adaptation of The Binding of Isaac. And then he had uh, an expansion for that and a game called Tapeworm and now Four Souls of Requiem. Now, this Kickstarter is for an expansion. So it is a card game expansion for The Binding of Isaac, and the genre of the game is essentially a semi-co-op fighter with Take That, and it seems to borrow a lot from Magic the Gathering and its gameplay, and somewhat from Munchkin, just in terms of the way it plays and, and the heavy amounts of Take That. Now, it's designed by Edmund McMillan. He previously designed The Binding of Isaac Four Souls, which was the original board game adaptation of The Binding of Isaac, as well as a game called Tapeworm. The main artist on this looks to be, although she's not credited yet, but looks to be Crystal Fleming, who has also been the lead artist on Edmund McMillan's other games. And as with those other games, this one is also published by his company, Maestro Media. The Binding of Isaac now plays one to four players with this new expansion. One of the big things that it brings to this is a new solo mode. And it also adds on multiplayer stuff like a dungeon crawl mode. Now there are many different pledge levels in this one because there is so much stuff going on and merch and stuff like that. As I said at the top, I'm not going to go over all of the additional add-ons that are just kind of merch. <laughs> I'm going to say merch more in this entry than I've ever said in my life. But let's go over the price levels here that do involve the actual game. So for $35, you can pledge Four Souls Requiem. And that is the new expansion and a rebalancing pack designed to integrate with the first edition of the base game. Now for $40, you can get the new second edition of the base game of The Binding of Isaac's Four Souls. That is just the base game. It does not include the new stuff. For $65, you can get the big boy box. Now that is the new stuff. So that is the Four Souls Requiem stuff with the extras and a bigger box so that everything fits in it. Now this does not include the base game. So this would be something that you would get if you already had the base game and you wanted to get the new stuff plus a bigger box storage solution. If you don't have the base game, and you want to get all that stuff with the big boy box and the new stuff, that's going to be the $110 pledge level for the full collection. So that will include the big boy box with Four Souls, Requiem, the new stuff, the extras, and the second edition base game. Now here's where we get into merch a little bit. So there's a pledge level called the Guardian Angel. It's $150, so it's $40 more than the full collection. It's basically the full collection with a six inch winged Isaac figure. For that extra $40, you're just getting that six inch figure and that's getting included in the pledge. 
And here's where things start to get to the point where you're just kind of giving them extra money because you want to help support them, but you're not really getting anything back other than little vanity type items. So for $300, the shitty signed tier, you're essentially getting that guardian angel package. So the full collection plus the six inch figure. And then you're adding in a Kickstarter exclusive signed paint with hand-drawn poop on it. So an extra $150 will get you that lovely addition. If you want to go up to the $800 level, because you really like Edmund McMillan and you're just throwing money at him, that is the everything but the sketch uh, pledge level, and that will give you everything we talked about previously, plus you're gonna throw in a lot of merch. And that merch will include four plush toys, four shirts, two beanies, two stress balls, a hat, 15 mega figures, uh, player mats, and the game Tapeworm. Now, if that's not enough, if Edmund McMillan is your family member or your boy and you want to keep giving him money, there's a $2,000 pledge level, and that will include everything that we've talked about previously, plus a jar of Edmund McMillan's bathwater. And the pledge level is called the Big Boy Bathwater. And that is a typical ridiculous Kickstarter thing that you should never pledge unless you are rich or born from chaos energy or a disciple of Edmund McMillan. So any of those three things, you can pledge some of those higher levels. But if not, I would recommend you to stop probably at the full collection level. Maybe the Guardian Angel if you love figures. So if all you want is the game. If you don't have the game before, the $110 level, that full collection pledge, that will get you everything that you possibly need without the kind of ridiculous merch add-ons. Now, with everything that's been going on lately with the shipping industry and all of the backups that are happening globally, there's definitely a bigger unknown on the horizon in terms of shipping. But for now, anyway, The Binding of Isaac is looking to deliver in June 2022. That brings us to Six Siege, the board game, which will fund on July 2nd. This is a board game adaptation of Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six series, specifically Rainbow Six Siege. Their minimum funding goal for this one was $100,000. They're currently sitting at a million dollars, which means they're cresting 10 times their minimum requested funding. Uh, this is for two to four players. I would class this one as medium heavy on the complexity and probably medium or low on the risk because it's being produced by Mythic Games. They tend to do a very good job with their games, nice production quality across the board. Uh, but they are kind of running late on delivering things quite a bit, and that was even pre-pandemic, so that's just something to be aware of with Mythic Games. Now, if you're not familiar with the video game series, it is a first-person tactical shooter. So that is what you're gonna be getting in a board game is a board game version of a, well, first-person tactical shooter, but obviously in this, it's gonna be more of a third person. And it's going to involve mechanics like action timers, so it's taking place in real time using an action timer. Uh, dice rolling, and variable player powers. So this game is designed by Carlos GQ. Uh, this is essentially his first published game. He has one other credit as a game designer, and that's for a game called Coreball, the Zero Gravity Sport Game. And that had a Kickstarter in 2019 that was canceled and uh, they never relaunched. So that game just seems to kind of be in limbo. But he designed that game, he's designed this one. This should be his first published game, unless something else gets published between now and the time that this actually releases, which could happen. Now there are three artists on this game. The first is Stefan Gantiez, and he has worked on Claustrophobia, Codenames, Libertalia, Lords of Zidit, Mythic Battles Pantheon, Seasons, Snow Tales, and Survive Escape from Atlantis. Also working on this is Henning Ludvigsen, and he has a ton of credits, a very prolific artist. He has worked on Arkham Horror, Arkham Horror the Card Game, Android Netrunner, Battle Lore Second Edition, Battles of Westeros, Black Rose Wars, Blood Rage, Descent, Journeys in the Dark, A Game of Thrones the Card Game Second Edition, The Lord of the Rings the Card Game, Mansions of Madness, Merchant of Venice Second Edition, Nexus Op, Sid Meier's Civilization, the board game, Star Wars, the card game, Star Wars Imperial Assault, 
Star Wars X-Wing Miniatures game, and Zombie Side Invader. And finally, the third artist on this game is Olivier Thill, who has worked on a game called Hell The Last Saga. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is published by Mythic Games, and some of their games include Mythic Battles Pantheon, Super Fantasy Brawl, and Time of Legends Joan of Arc. So there are three different pledge levels on this one. For $69, you can pledge the Fresh Recruit Pledge. That is the core game with the alternate zero operator. For $199, you can pledge the Trooper Pledge, which will give you everything from the Fresh Recruit Pledge, but it will also add in all five expansions and two map packs. And then finally, if you want to throw in some cosmetic extras, there is a bundle, the $269 Smooth Operator Pledge, that will give you everything from the Trooper Pledge, plus it'll add in a dice tray, an extra dice set, the LOS Laser, which I believe is kind of a component that you can use on the board to determine your line of sight, and the 3D Decor set. And Six Siege, the board game, is also aiming to deliver in June 2022. From there, we're going to go to something I don't preview as much, which are kind of limited runs of games. But this one is from AEG, which is a huge, fantastic publisher. And they're running this campaign uh, for people who maybe can't get out to cons this year. So this is called Big Game Night, AEG's premier convention experience. There's just one pledge for this one, but it's going to include two games and an expansion. Now, all of these games fall into the light range. They're really kind of more fillers. Uh, and just kind of light stuff, things that you would buy at a convention bundled together that you could play kind of quickly while you're doing other things at that convention. And because it's AEG, one of the best, biggest publishers in the business, this is a low risk. So there are three games here. Uh, there's three different player counts involved as well. So there's a game called 10, which will play one to five players. And 10 is a push your luck auction game where you're trying not to get over 10. It seems to have elements of the mind and blackjack, basically. Now, 10 was designed by Molly Johnson, Robert Melvin, and Sean Stankovic, and the art on this is by Sean Stankovic. Now, those three designers have worked together a bunch of times before. They've made games like Point Salad, Public Market, and Truffle Shuffle. It's the first time, however, that Sean Stankovic has handled the art duties, so this is the first published game for him on art. Uh, the second game in the, the the second game here is Tiny Town Villagers, which is an expansion to Tiny Town, and this is for one to six players. Now, design on this is by Peter McPherson, who is the designer of Tiny Towns, and he's working with Josh Wood on this expansion. Uh, Josh Wood has worked on the two other expansions, but Josh did not work on the base game. And Josh is the designer of Cat Lady and Santa Monica. And the art on Tiny Town Villagers is by Gong Studios. They have worked on Anne's Edge, Anne's Edge, The New Age, and Tiny Towns, the original base game. And a lot of what this expansion is doing is adding in 20 villager meeples and a lot of additional scoring mechanics that play off of those villagers. And if you've played Josh Wood's games, Cat Lady and Santa Monica, you'll know that he is genius at working with lighter games and adding in content that changes and reworks scoring variables. And then finally, the third game in this bundle is called Whirling Witchcraft. That game is for two to five players, so there's no solo capabilities in that one. It's designed by Eric Anderson Sundin. This appears to be his first published game. And the art on this is by two artists. One is Louis Francisco. He's worked on The Bloody Inn, Coup, Flashpoint Fire Rescue, Haggis, The Resistance, The Resistance Avalon, and Role Player. And then, the second at, and then the second artist is Weberson Santiago. He's also worked on The Bloody Inn, Coup, and a game called Fuji. And again, this is from AEG, so they are publishing the whole thing. That is Alderac Entertainment Group. And they have published a lot of stuff. So let's just go through the games of theirs that are in the top 1,000. So you'll see the kind of publishing catalog behind this company and the games that they're capable of making. So their output includes Automobiles, Calico, Cat Lady, Cubitos, Istanbul, Istanbul the Dice Game, Love Letter, Love Letter Batman, Love Letter Premium, Lovecraft Letter, Mystic Veil, vale, Point Salad, Smash Up, Smash Up Awesome Level 9000, Smash Up Monster Smash, Smash Up Pretty Pretty Smash Up, Smash Up Science Fiction Double Feature, Space Base, Thunderstone, Thunderstone Advanced Towers of Ruin, Thunderstone Dragonspire, Thunderstone Quest, 
Tiny Towns, Trains, Rising Sun, Valley of the Kings, and War Chest. Now there's only one pledge level for this. So if you pledge this, you're getting everything. It's all one bundle. You're getting all three games. It's a $40 pledge level. It's also only available for US residents. So just know you can't pledge this anywhere else in the world. This is only a US thing, which means that it's gonna be $13 shipping. Just that's what it is. So it's $53 for the whole pledge, including the shipping. And there's a limited number of copies for this one. So they started with 2000 copies. They're under 1,000 right now at the time of this recording. So I'm recording this on Monday, about 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time in the morning. And right now they're at about 990 copies left. So still plenty of copies. By the time I get this edited and published, there should still be plenty of copies. But if you want this one, uh, don't sleep on it. Just go over and pledge it. So you'll get those three games. $53 shipping including to the continental United States, I know for sure. I'm not sure about Puerto Rico, Alaska, and Hawaii. You'll have to double check on those because theoretically the shipping would be more for those and they have listed the $13 shipping. So it may be continental US only. Now the last of our games that are funding on July 2nd are Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid Rangers United. And there's been a bunch of Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid campaigns over the last few years. This is just more stuff. Their minimum funding goal was $10,000. They're currently sitting at $309,000. So they're at about 31 times their requested funding. Now this is for two to five players. It's a medium heavy game and it's being published by Renegade Game Studios, which is another really solid publisher. So the risk on this one is at low. This is an expansion. So you need to have Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid to use this. And the Power Rangers games are action points with variable player powers. Uh, they're adaptations of the TV shows and there are a couple movies as well. And it is a co-op game, co-op adventure. It is designed by Jonathan Ying. Uh, he designed Bargain Quest, Doom the Board Game, and Star Wars Imperial Assault. And now that he has had success with Power Rangers, this seems to have been kind of his main focus for the last couple of years. So there are three artists on this one. The first artist is Valerie Favocia. She has worked on Bandits of Mars and La Famiglia. The next artist is Catherine Lobo. She hasn't worked on any games that have been published uh, in terms of kind of base games. She did work on the villain pack for Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid. And then the third artist is Daniel Mora. He worked on the original base game Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid. And as I already mentioned, this is being published by Renegade Game Studios. They are another big publisher so let's list some of their games. <laughs> they have produced Altiplano, Arboretum, Architects of the West Kingdom, Circadians, First Light, Clank, a deck building adventure, Clank in Space, Clank Legacy, Acquisitions Incorporated, Dead Men Tell No Tales, Ex Libris, Explorers of the North Sea, The Fox in the Forest, Fuse, Honcho, Lanterns, The Harvest Festival, Paladins of the West Kingdom, Raiders of the North Sea, Raiders of Scythia, The Search for Planet X, Snow Tales, Trajan, Viscounts of the West Kingdom, Wendake, and World's Fair 1893. So Renegade has published a lot of the Clank stuff. That's one of their big claims to fame. And they've also co-published all the Garpel Games stuff. So all of the, of the North Sea and of the West Kingdom games. Now, what is this expansion feature, you ask? Well, I'm happy I can tell you. It features the delusional Omega Ranger Kia and her army of Tronics, also led by the corrupted Ranger avatars, Blaze and Roxy. And then also in this campaign, you'll get things like Elarion the Solar Ranger, the Beast Morpher Rangers, and the Omega Rangers. As someone who's not really into the Power Rangers, you'll notice there are quite a few cuts in there. You've got several different packs available through this campaign. So you've got a Dino Thunder pack, You've got the Ranger Allies pack number two. You've got the villain pack number four called Dark Turn. And you've got the expansion that's kind of the, the named expansion for this, which is Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid Rangers United. So you essentially have four different kind of expansions in this one. Now, for the $40 pledge level, you get to pick one of those things. For the $80 pledge level, you get to pick two of those things, and then you're gonna get an extra. Now the extras also kinda of have to be picked, and so you have a few extras to choose from. You have Ranger Dice Set 2, you have the Green Samurai Ranger Super Samurai Mode figure, and you have the, and you have the Zord Pack. So you're gonna have three of those extras, 
And for the $80 pick two pledge, you're gonna get two of the expansions you get to choose and then one of those three sets of extras. If you go up to the $120 pledge level called pick three, you're gonna pick three of the expansions and then two of those promo item packs. And then finally for 80, and then finally for $185, you're gonna get all four of the expansions and all three of the promo item packs. So everything. But wait, there's more. There's also a $299 pledge level, and that is called the New to the Party Starter Bundle. So that's gonna get you some different things. That will get you the base game with the Kickstarter Deluxe Box, so kind of the original Kickstarter base game. It will get you Rangers United, so it will get you the kind of expansion being advertised here as the name expansion. However, you will not get the other three expansions. So if you also want those, I think you'll have to add them on uh, in the add-on section. You will, however, get all three promo pack items. And you'll also get a card storage box and two dice sets with a fan appreciation kit. Now, Power Rangers is looking to deliver in September 2021, so that's very soon. So all of this stuff has to already be produced and ready to go. And you know some of it is previous things, but the new stuff, for them to be doing this, it's gotta be just already ready to go. Cause that is very, very fast delivery. But September, 2021, that's what they're aiming for with this. From there, we're gonna jump ahead to July 9th. So this, this next game will fund on July 9th. And that is Valor and Villainy Ludwig's Labyrinth. Now their minimum requested funding for this was $50,000. They're currently sitting at $285,000. So about six times their minimum requested funding. Um, so all of these things, you know, are very, very safe. They're obviously going to fund. They're, they're many times over their minimum requested funding. Now this one is for one to six players, so it does have a solo mode. It is a, I'd call it a medium light game. Oh, it's kind of like right on the border between medium light and medium heavy. And it is medium low. It's being produced by Skybound Games, and they have a pretty good track record. Uh, it is a co-op kind of RPG-based dungeon crawler. There's already a previous game in the series called Minions of Mordrak, and, and you'll be able to get that through the pledge levels. But the design of the new one, Ludwig's Labyrinth, is such that you can play it full co-op standalone, and you can also integrate it with the original base game. So if you just want to play this and you just want to check out you know, this IP and you just want to get this game, you can do it and it's it's gonna play standalone. But if you have the original base game, you can also integrate them and bring stuff from this into the base game and vice versa. So there's a lot of variability in how it works with the original, but you can play it by itself. It's not just an expansion. So the art and the design on this one is by one person and that's James Van Niekerk. And his first published design was the original game, Minions of Mordrak. However, he's also worked as an artist on other games uh, and that includes a game called Good Help. And then a game, one of my most favorite name games ever, it's called What's He Building In There? I've never played it. I just think it sounds really cool. It raises questions I need answered. And it is being published by Skybound Games, who have previously published The Grim Masquerade, Tidal Blades, Heroes of the Reef, and Trial by Trolley. Now for $60 on this one, you're going to be able to pledge for the retail version of the game. So that's the game with not deluxe type components. For $90, you're going to get the deluxe version of the game, which is going to add on 16 minis and a game tray storage system. For $135, you can get the premium bundle. So the premium bundle is going to get you the deluxe version of the game. So you will get the minis and the game tray system, but then they're also gonna throw in an additional expansion available through this campaign called the Antagonist's Arsenal expansion, as well as a premium plastic token kit. So the Antagonist's Arsenal expansion is not required for the games to be cross-compatible, they already are, but it's going to add in more ways for those games to be cross-compatible, uh, namely ways that you can play the villain. So it's gonna take Mordrak from the first game and add the ability to play him in co-op and solo. And it will add in the ability for five of the villains from this game, from Ludwig's Labyrinth, and add the ability for those five villains to play in 1v many mode. So that's what you'll be getting with that Antagonist's Arsenal expansion that you can get through the premium bundle, or I think you can also just get it as an add-on. And Valor and Villainy Ludwig's Labyrinth is aiming to deliver in September 2022. 
That brings us to our final two games. These games will both fund on July 15th. The first one is called First Ascent, and this is by a first-time designer, artist, publisher. She's doing it all on her own. It looks really cool, but keep in mind, this is a first-timer across the board. So there's a high risk involved with this one, even though I think the game looks really good for a first-time designer, uh, artist, publisher, and this is the kind of thing we should be as you know, members of this hobby who want to grow it and encourage new designers, this is the kind of thing we should be considering, I, I think, especially when it's done as well as this game. So it's called First Ascent. They had a minimum requested funding of $17,000. Uh, they're currently sitting around $40,000, so about 2.5 times their minimum requested funding. It is for two to five players. I would put this one looking at it as medium light complexity. And again, I think the risk is gonna have to be high because first timers across the board. Now it is designed with artwork done and published by a woman named Kate Otty. And her two big things are rock climbing and board gaming. And she's done a lot of play testing with both groups, which I really like. I think that means that, I mean, she's a board gamer herself already. So hopefully the play testing with board gamers is going to make sure that is a, a good game mechanically. But the playtesting with the rock climbers I like as well because it, it bodes well to the game being uh, very thematic and thematic in a way that integrates mechanically, which I think is really cool. I don't know of many other rock climbing board games. I know there's one called Summit the Board Game, but this looks more appealing to me from what I've seen. It uses card drafting and network and route building. So essentially your climbers are climbing up the mountain and they're building their climb path as they're going. So it's a little bit of a different take on network and route building than what we usually see when we're thinking about train games or you know other games where you're, you're building land and trading and stuff like that. In this case, you are building your route and network up a mountain. And there's also set collections. So as you're going to different areas on the map, you're going to be triggering different uh, icons and collecting sets of things. There's only one pledge level for this one. There's not a lot of uh, add-ons and extras and things like that. She's just put all of her focus into making one good version of the game and focusing on that. And I think as a first time creator, that's really smart. And it obviously worked because the game has funded. So there wasn't an issue of her, you know, trying to appeal to Kickstarter-y little hooks to, to get the game to fund it. It has already funded. So that pledge level is a $49 pledge level. It's called Climber, and that will get you everything you need. And this game looks really cool. I don't know if I'm personally gonna back it, but I definitely am gonna be trying to play it at some point. And if I like it, probably be regretting that I didn't back it. <laughs> if there's something that's super appealing to you, by all means, this, this is a good one to take a chance on, I think, because I'm impressed with this creator and what she's doing as, as a first time publisher. And it looks really cool. So this game, First Ascent, is aiming to deliver in uh, August of 2022. That brings us to the final game on our list. This game will also fund on July 15th. It's called Scarface 1920. They had a minimum requested funding goal on this one of $62,000. They're currently at $595,000, so they're cresting that 10 times figure. Now, Scarface is designed for one to four players, which is interesting, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and it looks like it's a medium heavy game, and I would put the risk on this one at high because it's by a first time publisher. Now, it's gonna use things like card drafting, area majority, and worker placement. And to be honest, it looks very, very similar to a, another game that's already published uh, called The Godfather Corleone's Empire. That game was published by Simon, but strangely enough, it didn't go through Kickstarter. It was just one of those games that Simon took directly to retail. So if, as I'm describing this game, if this game sounds really interesting to you, but you're a little worried about the Kickstarter part of it and, and the delay in funding and the fact that it's a first time publisher, you may go wanna take a look at The Godfather Corleone's Empire, which you can get at retail right now, and the games seem very, very similar. Now, I'm not saying that Scarface won't be as good or won't be better, it may be, but I think I won't really know until I personally play it exactly how well it matches up with The Godfather Corleone's Empire. I will just say from looking at the Kickstarter campaign, the two games do look fairly similar. I'm hoping that there is more stuff in Scarface 1920 
uh, to recommend it and to make it a game that's worth getting if you already have the Godfather Corleone's Empire or maybe just picking up this one instead. And one of those things may be the fact that this game does play at one player. So they're advertising it that way. That means there's got to be some kind of a solo mode in here, and there is not on the Godfather Corleone's Empire. So a distinction to be aware of. Now, there are two designers on this one. One is Tony Sarah de Sanfirm, and he has previously worked on games I don't know, but you may have heard of. Uh, Four Monkeys, Storytelling, and Victus Barcelona 1714. And then also Daniel Simon, and this is Daniel Simon's first published game. So two relatively new designers. And then the artist on this is Antonio Stappertz, who has currently worked on a game called 300 Earth and Water. And it is being published by an outfit, and it is being published by a new outfit called Red Zen Games. This is their first published game, their first Kickstarter, which is why we're dealing with a high risk level. We just don't know what they're capable of yet, and they have never published a game. They've never delivered a Kickstarter. So things to be aware of. <laughs> But it does look like a pretty good game and it is funding well. Now for $119 on this one, you can pledge at the master pledge, which is going to get you the game and the stretch goals. For $166, you can pledge at the big boss pledge level, and that will get you the base game and the stretch goals and a few extras. So you'll get card sleeves, you'll get plastic business markers, so that's an upgraded component, and then another upgraded component, the wooden goods crates. And Red Zen is looking to deliver Scarface 1920 in June 2022. So that brings us to the end of the seven games that I am highlighting that will be funding in the first half of July, July 1st through the 15th. And now we're gonna talk about the games that I actually personally pledged from the last video. So there are four of these. The first is Adventure Tactics, Adventures in Alchemy. Now, this was not a cheap pledge for me because I didn't pledge the first game when that came out. I've heard really good things about it. And it's kind of a uh, role-playing game, dungeon crawler, like think Gloomhaven, but themed for all ages. So it's gonna play lighter. It's kind of very cutesy, but I've heard it's really, really good. And so I decided to jump in and kind of just get everything. I probably will play this on the Twitch channel eventually once we launch that later in the year. Uh, but when you got everything for this, the original game and the new game and all the extras, it was not a cheap pledge, especially kind of for the all ages, you know, family friendly, cutesy game. Like it, it, was, it was no small drop on this one, but I did it, I pledged everything. And eventually I'm very much looking forward to making some videos for this one and playing it live on Twitch. I also pledged the Paris Deluxe Big Box. And this is another one that I passed the first time around. I just was pledging a lot of games. There were a lot more games on Kickstarter at the time. Uh, Paris is something that, I think there are a lot of games out there like it. Uh, just kind of a recipe game where you're collecting things and it's set collection. There's area majority going on. So you're trying to kind of stake out different areas of Paris, different kind of sections to get areas area majority on those sections. And it just looks like a game that I've seen a dozen times before. So it looked well made and it was something I wanted to play, but it wasn't something that I felt I needed to back at that time. However, then the base game came out, it got stellar reviews. It jumped up to the top of that kind of subgenre and what it was doing. And not only that, it has a lot of really good table presence. So a lot of the buildings that are gonna be there are kind of like 3D cardboard. It just looks really, really good on the table. So I said, okay, I should have probably <laughs> pledged it the first time around. I'm gonna pledge the expansion and pick up the base game with the big box. And this is a game that I'm also actually really looking forward to this. I tend to be a heavier gamer and and when I'm you know personally picking out a game, I will navigate towards heavier games. But I'm always looking for really good kind of medium light games that have good strategy and are fun and look good on the table. And you know, my, my fiance Kristen enjoys probably more of the, the lighter stuff. I mean, she still likes the strategy games, but I think she appreciates more of the medium light to medium heavy stuff and, and maybe not so much the heavy, heavy games where the rules can get just really involved and fiddly. So I think this is a game that she's really, really gonna like a lot. And I think there will be plenty of opportunity to play this one with 
uh, friends of ours that aren't so much gamers or lighter gamers. And from everyone I know that has played it, and I do know some people that own it and have played it, I've heard nothing but high compliments. I also pledged Fall of the Mountain King. And in doing so, I also pledged the original game in the Hall of the Mountain King. Now that was a game that I had missed on Kickstarter. Um, I really wanted to back that one the first time around, but I think at that time, there were a handful of games that I wanted to pledge and money was tight and I had to make some tough decisions. And so I never pledged in the Hall of the Mountain King the first time around. And I looked towards picking it up later but I wanted that deluxe version with the plastic pieces and almost instantly they were sold out on uh, Burnt Island's website. And I'm, I'm weird, I'm like a completist and I can be a stickler about things like that. So I, I kind of didn't want the game with the wooden pieces. Like I wanted to get this plastic Kickstarter version and there just wasn't a way to do that. I had even written uh, Burnt Island on their website a couple of times asking them if they were going to restock the plastic bits and the most I ever got was, you know, maybe at some point in the future. So when this Kickstarter came up, I jumped at my chance to get in the Hall of the Mountain King, the Kickstarter version. And I'm not sure if there was a way to do that without pledging fall. I know that was something with previous Burn Island campaigns where you couldn't pick up the base stuff, which was troublesome. And I think at one point, maybe with Endeavor Age of Sale, I, I ended up canceling my pledge for that one because I couldn't get the original base game. And then I think I, I was able to find the base game with the dual player boards, buying it secondhand. And so then I ended up going re-in and, and eventually did buy their expansion for Endeavor Age of Sail. Uh, anyway, long story short, I really wanted in the Hall of the Mountain King. So I used this campaign as a chance to get that. And then I also took a chance on Fall of the Lap Mountain King, which I didn't really investigate as much. And it's also a first time designer, but I took a chance. I took a chance on that one. And when Fall of the Mountain King comes out, I'll take a much closer look at it and make some videos for it. And we'll see how it fares in terms of first impressions and review videos. Um, but I am, I am looking forward to it. I like the Mountain King theming that they're creating. And so far, I'm excited about that IP and those games, and I'm really excited to finally own In the Hall of the Mountain King. I'm excited to get a chance to play Fall of the Mountain King, and then I'll see if I remain really excited about that IP in the future. But it's possible I could be fully on board and looking for them to make even more games set in that universe. And finally, I pledged the Isle of Cats. Don't forget the kittens. Um, I'm a huge Isle of Cats fan. I think it is a great game that is great for all player levels. Uh, it's, it's card drafting and tile placement, really. So half of the game is you're getting cards and you're trying to decide which ones to keep, which ones to pass on your neighbor. And then of the cards that you do keep, you're trying to decide which ones you're going to use for scoring conditions. So you're kind of creating your end game scoring conditions as you play over the course of the game. And I always love games like that where so much of the variability is dependent on gameplay and on your choices as a player. And specifically with games where you're creating your own end game scoring conditions, I, I really like that. I find those games uh, very fun and very fulfilling to play. So I'm a huge fan of Isle Cats and I like that card drafting. So just to go back and kind of finish what I was saying, you're either playing cards that will generate end game scoring conditions for you or you're using those cards for resources and ways to help you place the cat tiles. And then the other half of the game is placing these cat tiles on these boats. Um, thematically, you're trying to basically rescue as many cats as you can and then get off the island before the bad guy Vash shows up to, I don't know, do something bad with all the cats that are left behind. So you're trying to fit them on your boats and you're trying to fill up different areas for point scoring and then fulfill all the other scoring conditions that you're creating as you choose those cards. It is just such a good game full of such good choices. Uh, it definitely depends whether or not you like card drafting and tile placement. I mean, if you like those two mechanics, this is going to be an evergreen, I think. It is so good, it is my favorite tile placement game. But if you don't like those mechanics, you're not gonna like the game. I mean, you're not gonna like doing things you don't <laughs> like to do. If you do like those mechanics you and you haven't 
checked out this game or bought this game, you definitely should take a look at it. It's really, really good. I have the original game, I have the expansion, I have kind of all this stuff. So when this campaign came out, I knew I was going to back it and get all the new stuff. For me, this game sits in the same kind of space as an Everdell or a Wingspan, uh, just games that I think appeal equally well to lighter and heavier gamers and kind of operates in this game space where I think all of those complexity levels can come together and enjoy the game together. So it is just an unabashed across the board winner for me. Everyone should be backing Isle of Cats. And in fact, I think everyone did because Frank West, the designer, artist, publisher, had a huge success with this campaign. Uh, I mean, I think it was in like five million. And considering he is a, you know, this is a kind of a solo outfit. This is not through some big publisher. That, that's huge, and I'm really excited for Frank. He makes great games. I still haven't checked out The City of Kings. I really want to do that. And he should be hopefully flush with cash to be able to continue producing whatever games he wants to for the rest of his life, I mean, at least for the next several years. Uh, but that's a good thing because Frank is a great designer. He's also a great mensch of a guy, and the industry is much better off for him being in it and him designing games. So... I'm super happy for the success of that campaign. I'm super happy to be getting more of the game. And I'm super happy that Frank is empowered to produce a lot more stuff in the future. Now, normally I would talk about the games that I've acquired, but that has been none. And I think that has a lot to do with the shipping situation that's going on right now. So I have a lot of games that should have arrived this month, last month, the next couple months, but everything's just getting pushed back. Yeah, and you know, I'm actually fine with that because that gives me more time to catch up on a bunch of first impressions videos that I wanted to get done without all this new stuff coming in that I need to deal with. So hopefully when the new stuff does come in, I will be ready for it and can produce those first impressions videos for those games like that, which would be great. I think in the next two or three months, once all the games start arriving again, uh, I will be at a place where I can handle the new influx of first impressions videos for those newly arriving games, along with the uh, teaching reviews that I plan on segueing into as time goes on a little bit here. So nothing acquired this period. And finally, the last section is played games. This is a little shorter this period. Uh, I haven't had as much time to play games. I've kind of been doing some personal stuff, some post-COVID trips with my fiance and our puppy. So I have played, first up, Chronicles of Crime 1400. Uh, so my fiance and I have now played the final case. Uh, I am going to go through and play a few more times the last couple of cases just to experience everything that Chronicles of Crime 1400 has to offer. I have already produced a first impressions video on this one. Once I kind of finish uh, dotting those I's and crossing those T's, I will probably do a full teach and review video. And that also means that I probably very shortly will be doing a first impressions for Chronicles of Crime 1900, which I will be delving into very, very shortly. But in general, I will just tell you that Chronicles of Crime is a series that I really like. They are investigating games, so you are investigating a crime. There are set puzzles, set answers. So once you've played it through, you will know everything. Once you play it through a few times and kind of figure out all the little extras and the nooks and crannies, you will be done with the game. You won't be able to play it again. So I think there are five cases in 1400, and that includes a tutorial game. The cases get harder as you go, so there's you know, introductory through hard. The introductory and first case, you might get everything the first time through, and as you go through to the kind of harder level cases, it may take you two or three plays to find everything. By the time you get to the hard case, maybe it takes you four or five plays. Let's say a play of these games is maybe an hour or two, depending on kind of how much time you spend around. So if you've got five cases, an hour each, uh, maybe on average you play each case three times. 
So that's gonna be three times five, that's 15. So there's about 15 hours of play in the box and then you're gonna be done with it. And then you're going to sell it or give it to a friend or donate it to a children's hospital where sick children can enjoy it. Whatever you do with it, it is a limited replayability game. For what it is, it is really well designed. The art is fantastic. The cases are very thoughtfully constructed design-wise and very well-written dialogue-wise. So if you like this kind of game, this is at the top of that genre. Uh, it also needs an app to play, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, you cannot play it without an app. So not only do you need a device, whether that's your phone or a laptop, or I, I wouldn't want to use a desktop, but I suppose you could, or a tablet, you need a device and you also need uh, connectivity to the internet to be able to play. So just know that those are all prerequisites, requirements. If you have all those things, if you enjoy this kind of game uh, with, with limited replayability where you're solving a crime and it has a set solution, it's a really, really good one. Uh, the theming on this is it's 1400, so it feels very much, if you've ever played like an Assassin's Creed game, it is in that time period. So you're exploring that kind of setting, but instead of killing everybody, you are just solving crimes. You're solving mysteries and murders. I mean, maybe you are the guy who comes in after the assassins than Assassin's Creed have killed everybody and you're trying to figure out what happened. Um, now, there are several different versions of this. So 1400 is already out. 1900 just released, and that, as it sounds, is going to take place in the time period of 1900. So more of, you know, Victorian England kind of a thing. And then there's a 2400, which will release later. So they're still working on the app part of that game. But that will come out, I think, later this year. And that has a kind of futuristic cyberpunk theme to it. And then there's going to be a fourth game uh, that kind of travels through time. And I think it will use all the kind of components and scenarios from all three games and creates crimes that kind of link them together. So in my estimation, I've really liked 1400, but I think the theming of 2400 is going to appeal to me the most. I think that that cyberpunk theme is gonna be the coolest. Uh, so yeah, but I, but I did like the game and I think it's really well designed and as I said, the dialogue's good. There's a lot of a lot of like kind of fun and humorous moments because of the way that the dialogue is structured. A lot of them involve your dog who can sniff things. So, so you can, you know, pick up a piece of fabric, have your dog sniff it, and sometimes he will run to another location with you following. There are things in the game like that that are just uh, thematic and playful and and, and and immersive. And it's just, it's a very fun experience. So I, I would recommend it. Uh, I do have, as I said, I do have a first impressions video already up for that, so you can look at that. That one's, I shot that video a while ago now, so the formatting that I've kind of moved on to using, it's a little bit different in that, but you can still hear my thoughts on the game. Uh, I also played Curious Cargo. I have a very recently published first impressions video up on Curious Cargo, so if you want to hear more of my thoughts on that game, you can go watch that video. But I really like it. I'm rating it a nine for now, which is a very high score for me. Uh, it is a polyomino game where you are building a pipeline, well, multiple pipelines really, to ship out goods, export, and also import goods. They happen to be the same goods, so it's a little weird, but that's in the theming and it's meant to be kind of strange and fun and funny. Uh, and, and it is a heavy, especially for a smaller box, two player only game. It is a pretty heavy, chunky game. I'd call it medium heavy. It ships with a bunch of different uh, double sided player boards. And so you have a lot of variety to choose from in how you're building your pipe network. So different boards will have different machines in different places, different bonus tokens in different places. So it really adds a lot of variability to the game. Not that the game even needs that because I think there's so much variability in the gameplay itself. But when you add on those different kind of player mats, there's just a ton, ton of replayability in the game. It also comes with, so there's a kind of a player mat that you're building your uh, pipe network on. There's also a player mat where you are shipping goods from, and that is also double-sided. It has one side with two goods, one side with three different kinds of goods on it, and that will also change up the game and possibly make it more complex for you. 
Uh, I said in my first impressions video that I don't feel that the advanced game really adds in complexity because while it does add in another type of good to deal with, the tiles are a bit different and it seems to me that there are a lot more straight tiles which are easier to work with. So I think one aspect of that player board makes it more complex, one aspect of the tiles makes it less complex. So for me, I felt like it kind of balanced each other out. But it is fun to play with three goods instead of two goods, and it does give you more to think about good-wise and more player choices. And I really like both versions of the game. So I very much would recommend Curious Cargo to anybody that likes polyomino games. I think if you're really into patchwork, it's a very, very good next step from patchwork. Uh, just know that there's going to be potentially more take that in it. There's ways that you can kind of screw with your opponent and their uh, export chain. And also that it has a lot more variability than patchwork. So if you do like it, it's going to have a lot of legs. So high recommendation for me on Curious Cargo, and I really like that one. And that'll probably be in my collection forever. I like the fact that it is a smaller game that you can play with two players. I also like the fact that it comes in a smaller box. So it's a game that you could take and travel if you were traveling with two players and you know have in your car. Uh, there is some stuff going on on the board because you are placing all these tiles. So if you're trying to play it like in a car or on a plane, may not work too well for that. It may also be a little difficult to play on like blankets or something like that. But if you're just traveling and you're going and you're staying in, you know, motels or hotels or cabins or something like that, camping, I think there'd be opportunities to play it. And it doesn't take a lot of table space. It's just that it's got components that may move and shift around. Awesome game, high recommend. And then finally I played Merv the Heart of the Silk Road. And I'm actually gonna be working on a first impressions video for that after I shoot this video. So you'll probably see a first impressions video for Merv premiering within a day or two of this video. Um, although I am going out of town this week as well, so if I don't get it up within a day or two, it's gonna end up getting pushed probably till the weekend. Uh, I really like Merv a lot. Uh, it is a medium heavy kind of Euro game. You are building buildings on a modular tile board and you are generating resources and you're gonna use those resources to uh, score set collection. So there's kind of a recipe element to that game, but you're also gonna be activating buildings and there are about uh, six different kinds of buildings that you can activate and they all do different things and they all involve different mechanics and different tracks. And each of them can be kind of fiddly because not only are you kind of dealing with the thing on that, section of the game and the tracks. There are a lot of little other things that trigger and a lot of kind of extra rules. Um, so while I like the game a lot, and I'll talk about this more in the video as I, you know, once I produce it, while I like the game a lot and, and it fulfills my needs as a medium heavy and heavy gamer, um, it is a little more difficult I think to teach and it may take players a couple plays to kind of learn everything because there are things where even once you've kind of explained how all the different mechanics work, there are a lot of little exceptions or little extras to kind of all the different things. So if you are trying to teach the game or play with gamers who have this mentality of like, yeah, 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 let's just learn as we go. Let's, let, let's figure it out as we go. You're gonna miss a lot of stuff because you, you'll be able to learn the broad strokes, but then you might... Okay, one aspect of the game is that you are building uh, buildings in a, in a modular board, and at some point in the game, there are gonna be these invasions of Mongols that come and destroy all of the different buildings that aren't protected. So one of the actions that you can trigger is to build walls around the board. And there are some kind of fiddly rules about how those walls are placed. Cool, I'm sure you'll figure that out. But one thing that you might forget and that we did forget in our first game is that when you're building those walls, you're also getting uh, influence for different types of wall builds. And you need to be taking that influence because that influence will then allow you to buy more types of spice cards at the caravansary and allow you to complete higher levels of contract cards. But that influence is something that we just skipped over in our very first game. There were a couple things like that. So it's not a big deal. It's not like there's anything that's so complicated you're not going to be able to grasp it. But there are a lot of kind of extra little fiddly rules, exceptions to rules, and 
gamers may miss a couple things on the first play or two, and especially if they're just trying to power through and learn the game as they go, that I, I think they almost are guaranteed to miss a few things. So just know that. Just know that that as a game, if this is a game that you're considering buying or playing, that it may take an extra play or two just to work out all of the kind of little extra fiddly rules. Because I guess I would call it rules upon rules. So you kind of learn a first rule set, and then you almost need to learn all of the little exceptional rules that will add on to some of the main rules. Uh, and not every heavy game is like that. Some heavy games have a lot of mechanics, but each mechanic is kind of its own thing and straightforward. And so it's kind of how those mechanics interplay together. But this game also has direct uh, correspondences between mechanics, even in the activation of those mechanics. Just know that there may be a little bit more going on and a little bit more to process than other games of a similar complexity level. So that's the main thing that I'm trying to get across on that. <laughs> But I really like it. I like the game a lot, and having played it a couple of times now, and having a very good grasp on the rules, and knowing how everything interplays, uh, I do really like the game a lot. I'm looking over it because it's still set up on my table, and I'm about to film it after this video. Uh, I do like the game a lot, but I am aware that the teach is going to be, I think, a little bit more difficult and involved than other games of a similar complexity. And I'm anticipating that there may be some handful of gamers that won't like that extra kind of level to the teach and may check out a little bit. So just something to be aware of. But for me, I still really, really like the game. So that is a wrap on this video. This has been the early July 2021 Kickstarter update. We've also talked about the games that I pledged last time around. We've talked about some games that I've played. Thank you very much for sticking around to this point. If you did, welcome to the channel. Welcome back. Please like and subscribe down below. That's going to help me grow things and produce more and better content. So if you like what you're seeing, like and subscribe. Click the alarm bell if you want to be notified whenever I produce future content. And all of those things will help me continue to produce more and better content along these same kinds of lines. I hope I helped you make a Kickstarter backing decision on one or more of these games. I will be out of town this week for a couple days on a little trip to Carmel. And when I come back, I will be doing a first impressions video for Kanban EV. And then that will conclude the remaining first impressions videos I wanted to get out uh, for games that published in 2020. And then I have about eight more to catch up on for games that published in the first half of 2021. So you'll see those coming from me during the month of July. And then hopefully by the end of July, I'll be all caught back up. And at that point, you will see only first impressions videos for games where the Kickstarters are delivering or I am purchasing uh, from retail because they have just released. And at that point in August, you should start to see full teach and review videos from me. And then sometime in August, perhaps September, I will be introducing you to my buddy Ryan Everly. We will be doing some videos together and we will be starting things out, doing our top 100 games of all time which will be on the heels of me doing my top 25 games of 2020. So lots of content coming in the next few months. That's sort of an outline of it. Hopefully that whets the appetite. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a great week gaming, however you're able to game right now. Hopefully things will continue to open up post COVID and we'll be able to play uh, more and more of our favorite games at higher player counts with more and more of our friends. I'm really looking forward to that. Take care, everybody. I will see you soon in the next video, which should be Merv, the heart of the Silk Road, first impressions. And until then, happy gaming. Take care.